Hi and welcome to Tomac Let's Talk. A tiny strip of land nestled between the Arabian Sea and the Western Ghats. Greenery, beaches and backwaters. Kerala, destination of a lifetime. Today we have with us Secretary Kerala Tourism, Mr. Suman Billa. Let's talk. Responsible tourism is the hot word in the tourism industry today. What is responsible tourism and how far has Kerala progressed on that front? Well, responsible tourism, you know, typically is an extension of sustainable tourism as it were because I think about seven, eight years ago we've been talking about tourism and how you have to make it sustainable. And responsible tourism goes one step ahead and uh, talks about basically three pillars on which it stands. The first is you have to be environmentally responsible, which means whatever is the intervention that you do as a part of tourism has to be, you know, environmentally sustainable and it has to be responsible from that point of view. Two, it has to be economically responsible, which means that tourism should not be just for uh, the sake of the tourist and the entrepreneur who has the hotel, but it has to, the, the returns from that must percolate down to the community and, you know, tourism must become an all-encompassing thing which brings the community within its you know, ambit. So largely it plays out in terms of the number of jobs it generates for local community and the level of procurement uh, that happens from the local community. Because you have hotels today, say in some of the hotels in Maldives, where everything, you know, starting from the bread to, you know, to the sausages to eggs, are flown in from uh, Germany. You know, but when you do a model like that, you're actually talking about an ecosystem which completely excludes the locals. Uh, there's a tourist who comes, he has a great time, there's an entrepreneur who oh, brings nice. things yeah. in, he makes money, and there's nothing in it for, for the entrepreneur, for, for, the, for the local community. So I think the idea is really is to, you know, how to make the local community part of, you know, a stakeholder and part of this whole process and how the returns from this actually go back to them. Uh, the third pillar is to the social responsibility and which is, I think, very important from the point of view of generating certain level of respect and awareness for the cultures uh, to which the tourist visits. So, you know, if you are typically, say, from the UK and you come to Kerala, you should have had an opportunity to understand and, you know, look at the soul of Kerala, understand its culture and respect its people and go back with that positive understanding. And similarly, I think the interaction must be two-way two in the sense that even the local community must be as much enriched by the interaction with the tourist as uh, the tourist is enriched by his interaction with the local. So, you know, it's basically around these, these three things that we do. You know, a long time ago there was a, you know, on the BBC there was a, there was a program of uh, a little boy was asked in Cuba on mm -hmm. what he would like to be when he grows up. And he mm -hmm. said, the tourist, <laughs> okay. you know, so, which really to my mind, you know, captures that because mm -hmm. the local community thinks that here comes mm -hmm. the tourist, he has a great time okay. and he goes back, there's nothing in it for us. Okay. So that is something that we want to, you know, change through this system of responsible tourism. And especially in a place like Kerala where, uh, the, where just because I think nature has made us so that we are heavily populated, whether you like it or not, <laughs> you will have to interact many times and on several for several things with people who live around you. Okay. And I think the only way we can take this industry forward is by, you know, getting onto this platform of responsible tourism. Uh, the rains are here. So what is the Department of Tourism doing to promote uh, monsoon tourism? Well, you know, we had promoted monsoon tourism some time ago in 2005-06. Subsequently, that got converted into a dream season in which we did the summer and the monsoon together. Okay. Uh, but recently, when we did some brainstorming, we thought that Look, the summer is anyway taken care of because yeah. all across India when there are holidays, people are compelled to travel and yeah. people will travel to Kerala. So what is really peak season for international is really peak season for domestic. But uh, if you really look at the way the numbers are panning out, I think 
the monsoon months are really the weakest and there is a you know mm -hmm. sort of a necklace formation like that if you look at the graph mm -hmm. so i think the three months when there is a dip that is typically june july and august are something we need to focus on so we've just launched a monsoon campaign uh, which kicked off last month and the response has been encouraging has been very has been very promising i get the the, the feedback that i get from the trade is that the numbers are being generated Earlier, one of the things that we said was, uh, the platform that we played on was we said, if you are the kind of a guy who cannot afford Kerala mm -hmm. during the peak season, <laughs> okay, then perhaps, the monsoon. Yeah, when you are, yeah, during the monsoon, it's going at a discount, so you might just be able to do that. Uh, now, we've not taken that price platform at all. Okay. Uh, we are basically pushing it more aggressively, as monsoon is a time when you should visit Kerala because mm. it's beautiful, it's great for Ayurveda mm. and it's a great time for uh, for younger people to romance and for older people to reconnect. So that's the kind of a you know platform. It's mostly about togetherness. Yeah, I saw, I saw some of the ads yeah. and that's what is being pitched. Right. Uh, you mentioned Ayurveda. Monsoon is also the best season for Ayurveda right. and there's a huge draw among foreign tourists for Ayurveda, uh, which are the catchment areas as regards Ayurvedic tourism? Typically, I think uh, the single largest market is Germany because typically okay. most of the people who come for Ayurveda to Kerala is, if you were to sort of look at, you know, a concentric circle, I think of all the number of people who come from Germany, you'll have a significant number of them coming for Ayurveda. Okay. But we also have good numbers coming from France and, you know, England and some parts of Europe. Uh, off late, I think for the past few years we've been pushing this in uh, the Middle East platform and we see I see encouraging numbers coming from Saudi Arabia okay. from UAE okay. so from the Middle East as well and Middle East it also plays out because uh, for them this is the peak summer season and therefore uh, it's a great time for them so to take come a and break. catch up to the rains. Uh, the seaplane uh, service that was launched uh, recently kicked up some amount of uh, controversy. Uh, what is your response to the critiques? Well, you know, typically as things happen in Kerala, if you, anything that you want to do, there will be some opposition. Mm -hmm. But I think irrespective of political colour or posturing that various people do, I think you mm -hmm. must look at the issue on its merits. Mm. There is a DPR which has been done by Pawan Hans, which has been on my website for the past almost a year now. Okay. And the DPR has covered more or less most of these issues. What are the concerns that are being raised? The first is, they say that there, the seaplane will create turbulence in the water. Mm. Uh, the DPR clearly states, and it is, and it is you know, axiomatic to, public, to say, yeah. that a seaplane's propeller is not in the water. A speedboat's propeller is inside the water. So the amount of turbulence it causes is far higher than what a seaplane does because the, yeah. this is actually in the air. And yeah. two is they say there's a noise pollution. Mm -hmm. And that is also brought out clearly in the DPR and we've actually demonstrated it when, we, when the plane came here, mm -hmm. is that the sound that is generated is only for one minute when it takes off. Mm -hmm. and, the, and in terms of decibel levels, it is much lower than somebody operating a chainsaw. Okay. And the third thing that people have been saying is about the possibility of oil spill and uh, mm -hmm. fuel spills, which can happen on the water and happen that. Mm -hmm. We are very alive to that, and which is why we have said on none of the water drones will any aircraft be allowed to be opened up for repair or for okay. fueling. Okay. Whatever maintenance activity or refueling activity has to happen will happen in the airports. Okay. So unless I am satisfied that I can do the refueling part at the water drome without affecting the quality of the water, we will not allow that. Okay. Uh, well, some some criticism has been that, you know, traditional fishing grounds are being mm -hmm. impinged upon. Mm -hmm. uh, but when the team went and, you know, when we actually did that, there was a lot of exercise which was done and we have only chosen those areas which are suitable and which do not have uh, regular movement of, in, you know, in terms of boats and all that, and where fishing is to its barest minimum. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, our assumption is that there is virtually no fishing in the places where we have done. But even assuming that seasonally people come and, you know, seasonally put it up, uh, well, I think we have more or less addressed that. So as far as I am concerned, I think we have taken all the precautions that need to be taken while launching this project, and I wouldn't have launched it if I was any less confident of it than I am. Okay. But having said that, uh, I also understand that, you know, there are various people who might have 
a lot of apprehensions about the project. We are willing to talk to them, you know, and I think it's only a matter of uh, all of us sitting together and understanding each other's point of view, and I'm sure that we can find a way out of uh, uh, the Muziris project is India's largest uh, heritage conservation project. Yeah. Tell us a bit about this venture. The Muziris is really, you know, it's a very fascinating project to do because uh, if you look at the history of Kerala, it has always been at the heart of the, you know, globe as it were, at the heart of the world as it were, because people have come to its shores in search of spices. And the interaction really goes back from 600 BC and, you know, it's still continuing to the present day. Uh, the Muziris was the first global port of Kerala. So if you read Pliny and if you read the Sangam Age literature, it all says, the reference is, he calls it, uh, Pliny calls it Primum Emporium Inde, which means it's the most important market of India. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the port just dropped off the map as it were because mm -hmm. of earthquake and the river mm -hmm. changing its course and all of that. So part of the excitement is that we are actually chasing and trying to look at History the port which is lost. Yeah. Okay. And we have not yet found, you know, the actual site of Muziris, but I am sure that we will get to that eventually. But the project area that we are talking about of 150 to 200 square kilometers is, is very fascinating because I think that is where influences of people from 600 BC to the present day are there. I don't think there is any other you know, piece of land in which there is such a great deal of uh, History. elements okay. pertaining to different eras and periods, uh, you know, across time. And, you know, the Jews, the Phoenicians, you name it, they've all been there. Two, I think it's a great model to look at how Kerala has always been a peaceful place in the sense that we have, all of these 31 countries who have come, we have traded with them and we've got on with life. Mm -hmm. We have assimilated them as it were, and mm -hmm. we have not fought and, you know, created. So I think it shows that uh, the Kerala mentality to be able to adjust and, you know, look at things for towards peaceful resolution. Mm -hmm. Second uh, important fact is that the great level of religious tolerance that uh, Kerala has displayed, because when the Jews have come, the Islam, the Christians, you know, Thomas came in AD 42, and uh, Christianity came to Kerala even before it reached Rome. So from that point of view, I think it's again a great uh, showcase for uh, religious tolerance and assimilation. You know, we've not uh, discriminated against people who came here. Okay. They have been honored, they've been given tracts of land, they've been given rights to work on. So I think, you know, today the biggest problem in the world is people are trying very hard not to live with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think Kerala can be a great model to the world on how tolerance, and being practically being able to you know peacefully resolve issues for everybody's betterment and i think it's a great model and which is what we're pitching now in uh, we've elevated the muzuris to a spice route project mm -hmm. uh, which is now being pushed by the united nations world tourism organization and the unesco as far as kerala is concerned we will be doing three things we will be using Fort Cochin because that's where a lot of spice heritage is already there. There is no such thing as specific tourism infrastructure. You know, typically when a tourist comes, he's using the infrastructure that is already there. You know, Keralites are by nature attuned to receiving tourists because I think we're generally friendly, you know, we're generally open, welcoming. So all of that is there. I don't think we could have done any worse than where we are because I think it's really we've really been growing at a torrid pace. Yeah, we have beaches, backwaters, we have hill stations and we have uh, Ayurveda. So these are the four pillars on which we operate.